are very much hoping to fill in a productive way. It's a very important position. Um, and it will bridge, uh, be a person who bridges uh, mathematics as well as mathematics and science education. So obviously you're a crucial one to our center. Um, and today you'll hear a talk from her um, who really in many ways embodies that, that crossing of land, that crossing of space between pure mathematics and mathematics research and mathematics teaching with sort of the concepts and practice of, of mathematics education. And I'd like to go over Herb's credentials and his background just a little bit so that you can see the way both of these worlds uh, come together. Herb got his AB at Holy Cross College in Massachusetts, and he got both his master's and his PhD at UC Berkeley. His research area is in complex geometry, and yesterday he gave a talk to the, um, to the math department about his, his research in, um, in geometry. Um, he started out his career in Chile, actually. He joined the Peace Corps for two years, um, and had quite an impact on Chilean mathematics during the course of his service there. Um, early on, he spent um, several years at the Institute for Advanced Study in, at Princeton University. And in the early 70s, he um, had faculty appointments at Columbia University and at Harvard University. In 1975, he joined the faculty here in the mathematics department um, in, in 1975 at the UU. Um, he continued here for 25 years, so as he's been uh, sort of Moving around the department and the university, we don't have to worry about you know, walking him to different places because he knows everywhere on campus and he knows lots and lots of people who are here. Um, he spent a year in Italy in 1997 and 98 and then became a professor of mathematics at Ohio State University where he has been for the last 10 years. He's had many, many um, honors. Uh, he's published many papers, both in mathematics as well as mathematics education. I'll just mention that he's a, he was a Fulbright scholar uh, he, was, he had a Sloan Fellowship. And um, when we asked him the other day about you know, where he got, with this illustrious math career, where he sort of turned and moved more towards <coughs> mathematics education, it actually turns out that he began um, going to the school of his own children. And that got him interested in mathematics education as he tutored them there and his, their classmates. Um, in 1991, he wrote a book, The uh, Geometry for the Classroom. And so he began sort of moving his career into where he stands now as one of the foremost math education uh, people here in the country. Um, I want to mention something in particular that I, I feel particularly drawn to Herb's career, and that is that was he was one of the first founders and um, also the first director of the Park City Mathematics Institute. And many of you are, are aware of that wonderful institution. For three weeks, we have a gamut of people coming to that institute. Uh, from research, professional, mathematics, uh, faculty members, uh, mathematics teachers, <coughs> high school teachers, and students who come together, stay together, gather, talk, eat, and really live and work mathematics together. So it's one of those few cross-cultural, so to speak, academically cross-cultural institutions that we have, and Herb was largely responsible for, um, for its uh, initiation and for its maintenance. So with that, I'm welcoming uh, Herb here, and his talk is on mathematics teachers as professionals. Thanks, Herb. Thank you. What a too generous introduction. <laughs> yeah, I, can you all hear me? Do I then? I don't need the mic. Good. Okay. <laughs> can you read it from video? Is that okay? I think we're okay. Okay, so, um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I don't think of myself as a professional mathematics educator, but um, I have a career-long interest and involvement, so take what I have to say with, today with a grain of salt, <laughs> because um, it's, a, it's kind of a personal view, and, and um, I hope that um, I've made the talk sparse enough that uh, we can generate questions, comments, discussions at any point during this. And if we get to the end, we get to the end. If we don't, we don't. So, very good. So, um, so yeah, um, thank you all for the, the opportunity. Uh, it's really good to be back here. Like Lee said, lots of friends. The walking around campus part is not quite so easy as she indicated. There's been an awful lot of change on this campus in the last 10 years. It seems like there are twice as many buildings as, as there were. And a lot of the old ones have, have, have kind of 
change. So um, I wanted to do a little uh, preface to the talk. And um, of course, I'm here because of potential involvement with uh, the uh, Center for Science and, 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 and Math Education. And so I wanted to kind of clarify the, the interface between what I'm going to say and that. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, the Center for Science and Math Education has been really <coughs> I saw that the S came before the M. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's for both sides of mathematics education and, and their interaction. And um, although I see the, the two as having slightly different contexts of mandates, just given the configurations of the disciplines that make them up, um, compatible but somewhat different, I'm, I'm going to, the remarks today all involve math. Uh, I'm going to focus on math. And um, so, um, and even within that context, uh, I want to narrow the, the, the focus uh, even a, a bit more. So, for instance, the center has many projects that I, I think are very exciting and interesting in, in math education. Probably for me, the most exciting one is the New interaction with uh, Math for America, which I think is a, is it is a gateway to to national connections that could be a, a, a great benefit uh, uh, in the in the long run. So um, uh, I admire those, but I'm not going to talk about those. <laughs> so. Um, I, I want to um, just try to uh, make a case for, if you will, one possible set of opportunities, direction, um, context for what might be a, a, a potential next step for the uh, mathematics education not only the, the, the center, but the, uh, the, uh, the work that this university does in, 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 in teacher education. And so, um, and this is going to be uh, framed around the common core state standards in mathematics. How many in the room know about those? Not everybody, but almost, right? Uh, so this is um, this is a big deal. Um, so what are we? As a nation, we are 230 sub years old. Um, we education, mathematics, and other in this country has always been local. It has always been. We owned and operated. Um, there have been, uh, yeah, this has advantages, this has disadvantages. I don't know how many, I think there were there 42 school districts that for a long time, essentially totally independent school districts in the state of Utah. There are 450 of them in Ohio. <laughs> and until, until the 19, 90s, I would say, basically every school district uh, locally owned and operated, school board, uh, superintendent district, uh, choose your own curriculum, choose your own books, uh, <laughs> uh, and um, then there began a movement toward more consolidation, more, if you will, uh, interchangeability between different places in what, uh, what was being done in, in mathematics education. And that has led to uh, now the Common Core uh, State Standards in Mathematics. Um, that's uh, not national. In fact, I think there is even a law against there being national <laughs> curriculum. 
in this country. But it's, um, it is a, a, a private initiative, uh, essentially uh, championed by business governmental uh, interests um, to move toward a voluntary consensus <laughs> on standards, coherence, development uh, in uh, mathematics education. And um, 45 of the 50 states have bought on. Uh, some of the audience would probably name the five states that haven't. The one that always comes to mind is the state that still considers itself a separate country, and that would be Texas, right? <laughs> but anyway, um, I hope I have any Texas still. <laughs> uh, anyway, so um, I think, uh, and many people do, that uh, this is a great thing. It's a tremendous opportunity. Um, the um, the leadership in the formulation of the uh, grade by grade uh, mathematical development topics, uh, coherence uh, K through 12, came uh, in a fair margin out of the math community, also came out of the teaching community and, and the math education community. But um, the, the, it, it, it represents not only coherence, but it sets the bar um, reachably higher, but significantly higher than the average uh, requirements uh, that exist in the various districts around, around the country today. So it's a tremendous, yeah, uh, it's a tremendous opportunity. So, um, uh, more focus, things that it has, right? I'd say more focus, more coherence, a little bit less is more, a little bit with one eye on high achieving countries in mathematics education and what they do. Um, and uh, the most important ingredient is it's a common text. <laughs> so I, I would say, and uh, Bill McCallum, who's the chair at the University of Arizona, who chaired the writing committee of the, the, for the uh, math standard, cites that all the time. That, uh, you know, you move from Utah to Ohio, um, your kids change schools, um, maybe there's some coherence in the preparation that they had while they were here. And, Forward. And also, in terms of the national dialogue, on the way forward, there's a common text from a frame of reference. It's not perfect, but it's better than not a common text, even if some of that, uh, some, there are pockets of the common text. Excellent. Okay. So, um, so this is great. Um, I think it, it, it presents a tremendous opportunity. On the other side, um, we all know that in, in uh, life and politics and, and uh, policy in this country that Americans are patient. Uh, Americans, we have short attention spans. I have personally a short attention span. <laughs> and uh, so I, I appreciate the weakness, but um, I just wanted to go back to what I feel is the biggest threat to taking advantage of this opportunity. Uh, and that uh, biggest threat, um, I guess I would, uh, unrealistic timetable for implementation, unrealistic uh, calendar for beginning assessment. Uh, the so the, the example, I want to go back to one that, uh, well, the, the, some generations in this room will remember, others may have heard of, called the new math uh, as, a, as a kind of case study in, in what I can see as the, the, 
than the hour side. So anyway, um, so with, yeah, and I'll read this one. I, I wrote it, I believe, it, that, that this external, and I think it's external to, to the teaching profession and, and to the subject, political imperative uh, disrespects teachers as professionals and dooms them to failure by assigning an impossible task. <laughs> okay. But uh, this particular American Greek is not new, new map up. I took this out of, uh, there's something called getthescoop.com. If you take any subject and you know historically put it, so I put in new map. And uh, I thought it was not a bad uh, uh, kind of uh, summary. So new map. So how many people have heard of new map? Oh, so almost everybody. Okay, new map. After Sputnik was launched, right, the um, Americans felt that, that schools were going to get, get gobbled up by the Russians. <laughs> okay. So um, the uh, National Science Foundation created, uh, that was only created in 1950, uh, the research agenda was broadened, got an education agenda, began to examine and promote change, uh, improvement, and uh, change in curriculum, start at the high school, filtered out, in fact, to elementary school, and uh, the main thrust you will recognize, <laughs> right, was a switch from teachers telling students and student recitation to inquiry and discovery with the hope that students would be more likely to retain information and uh, that they found out themselves than what was just told them in the memory. Right. So this was the, but then there's uh, new math now. So this was uh, the implementation, the materials called SMSG, School Math Study Group. Big yellow, yellow books or, yeah, right. <laughs> Um, came out of the math community, they were given the charge of how to write some stuff, and of course, mathematically, fine. I mean, yeah. But uh, the new math downside came that 10 years later. Um, this was the summing up that I got out of what's the scoop, right? And I think it, it's fair. So the teachers were quite resistant to this, noting that. Uh, the instruction of the class as a whole was less uniform, and that the possibility of some students falling far behind was greatly increased. Parents were more vocal in their opposition, claiming they couldn't help their third graders anymore. <laughs> and uh, within our homework, and pointing to noticeable decline in more concrete skills. Okay. And um, uh, how many have heard of Tom Lehrer? <laughs> okay, so yeah, this great, I mean, great bunch of songs, I mean, everything from the garbage in the bay to <laughs> all kinds of uh, social commentary. And, and his bathroom was on the new map, and the, the uh, um, yeah, this great line, right? It's so simple, so very simple that only a child can do it. <laughs> so so uh, by 1976, only 9% of the school districts were using ASF curriculum in their math uh, program. And Morris Blythe, why Johnny can't add, a popularizer of the sentiment from uh, actually out of the professional community. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, near perfect regularity, teachers applaud the return to traditional content and instructional methods and quote the higher standards of the students' performance. So um, new math kind of, uh, yeah, there's some very good things. Uh, in fact, uh, some of my colleagues of my generation were children of the new math who took those yellow books and it didn't matter what the teacher did. Oh yeah, this is, this is good stuff. Yeah. Uh, so there were good things, but it, it was a political, a, a political disaster in, in the 
large scale. Straight scoop, it was streetdope.com. <laughs> That's where I'm quoting from. <laughs> Not a professionally approved source. <laughs> anyway, so uh, what was uh, one thing that Numat missed was um, the implementation process. Um, and a piece of that process should have been massive and sustained professional development and preparation for teachers. And on the professional development side, uh, it's going to be one of my main points, by teachers. Um, uh, part of the reason for that is the job's just too large for anybody else. Um, there are more than a million teachers of mathematics in this country, right? If you take... Uh, all the math education faculty, all of the school district, whatever's uh, math specialists and all of that, uh, not, not anywhere near to scale with the magnitude of the issue. Um, and for many other reasons, but for that reason, um, I think the, uh, the teaching community itself has to be brought into leadership roles in the configuration and uh, implementation of any, uh, any change uh, for it to succeed. So um, there is a support role that has to be, uh, has to go along with this. I mean, government mathematicians, math educators, all the constituencies have a role to play, but that role uh, is, I think, has to be more in a supportive role of the profession itself. So, um, yeah, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, oh, yeah. So, um, this both in terms of content and in terms of practice. Um, and this is an it's sort of obvious. I mean, that, that takes a generation. I mean, that takes 20 years, 30 years, with some, some consistent framework focus over a very extended period of time and not beginning to assess two or three or five years down the line and start, uh, start uh, beating on teachers and uh, uh, the education. So this work will take a generation. And people cite Finland as, as, a, as a case study of, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, they were down in the international uh, uh, exams or whatever. There's a PISA and, and there's uh, there are various international uh, comparisons. And um, so it was in the 70s or 80s, they uh, you know, changed national policy, they upgraded the status of the profession, I mean, um, of teachers, they, um, anyway, there, there, there are many places, many studies have been done on it, but Finland is a small place. Finland is a homogeneous society, right? And it took them 25 years to do this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, anyway, you get the idea. However, if we are paid to be patient this time, big if, and stay the course, right? Um, over the course of that generation or two that it will take, I think that this, um, what is going on now, plant the seeds of an opportunity for the profession of teacher of mathematics to also um, make major gains as it invests itself in this implementation, as long as it isn't uh, nipped in the bud by assessment.
So um, now I want to bring that back to the the uh, to Utah to uh, some of the particular opportunities that I feel that that Utah in general and this university in particular has to uh, to play a role in uh, the dynamic that, that, that we were just talking about and. Um, so I'll, I'll preface this by saying uh, that there, there's a, well, you know, I was here for 25 years, I know, but, but I mean, everybody's working so hard, doing so much to say, oh my gosh, putting more on the plate, you know, we're, we're going 120% or whatever it is, there was some bank that did 110% around here, but, um, <laughs> Which bank was that? Bless for security. Oh, bless for security. <laughs> <laughs> they did 110%, but it wasn't enough, right? Yes. <laughs> anyway, um, and, and uh, you know, how can we take on more? Um, and I guess I want to uh, make the case that um, that by taking on a little more or opening ourselves to a little more, we can make the job inside of Utah, in, in our own work, easier and bring more resources to it. So, so um, let's talk about the long-term professional development strategy for math education that, um, that puts teachers uh, into uh, leadership roles. So, um, Oops. Hello. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, one piece of that, that's sort of obvious, right? It's not obvious for any deep insight. It's just sort of obvious because there aren't many alternatives. <laughs> um, of doing that would be identifying, supporting, and uh, nurturing pockets of professional excellence. Um, where they exist, right? And um, here in Utah, I'm going to say that one place that has been a player, I mean, is, is the Park City Institute. We didn't do it well when we first started in the 90s, but it took about 10 years to figure out how to do it. But the professional development for mathematics teachers, the program they have there, now uh, competes with anything out there. Three components to professional development, continuing to do mathematics, reflection on your practice, and becoming a resource to your colleagues and the profession. Okay, that's the model, and, and they do it well. Um, uh, the University of Utah and its uh, mathematics education operation, I think, has an opportunity to take advantage of that more uh, than uh, has been the case today, even though, I mean, PCMI is a University of Utah initiative. Um, so, Phase two, and here is, um, I want to come back to this uh, teachers as professionals. So the, the mantra here is mathematics teachers themselves should have a leadership role in implementing the Common Core State Standards from the beginning, and that role should expand throughout the implement, uh, its implementation. Uh, the dual goals of implementing the standards and raising professional status of teaching are closely linked, and we have an opportunity to achieve both goals uh, in the coming years. So, um, in that context, I want to just take a brief, if you'll permit me, uh, aside on one initiative that, um, that uh, I personally am involved in um, that I feel um, represents that particular philosophy and, and direction. So there's something called the Conference Board of Mathematical Sciences. It's, it's the various 
math related organizations uh, together in, in Washington, D.C. twice a year and uh, um, discuss policy sometimes, tries to encourage things. Um, anyway, uh, it has begun to take a role. I'm currently connected with, with them. And we have a committee called the Ad Hoc Committee, big long name, Ad Hoc Committee on Teachers as Professionals. CPAP for short. Sure. Okay. So what's the idea? So uh, yeah, this is unfair. This is one of my unfair sentences. <laughs> it's um, I'll put it up there, and I'm prepared to discuss it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, it's in the back of the minds of some, some of us who are involved in these that much of what passes for professional development for teachers of mathematics consists of other people and groups telling teachers what to do. <laughs> and um, indeed, there are examples of uh, leadership from within the profession with authority to speak to those other constituencies and uh, gain their respect. Um, so, the, um, about a year and a half ago, um, the, uh, at PCMI, the Conference Board of Math Sciences brought together th this group of national constituencies around the premise of uh, using, if you will, The, the Common Core State Standards and their implementation as a, an opportunity to, to pursue the um, enhancement of the status of the profession of teacher of mathematics and uh, engaging currently practicing teachers in the leadership of the design and delivery of uh, the implementation, uh, for the implementation of professional development. Okay, so that's the list, and uh, it's broad enough that uh, there's some serious political support there, so that's good. Uh, the premise that those groups came uh, came around uh, came together around is. Um, we believe that mathematics teachers should have a leadership role in implementing CCSSM. That's the, you know, all these acronyms. Anyway, uh, from the beginning, and that role should expand uh, throughout the implementation. Inevitably, this will open new avenues for the professional engagement of teachers, often connected with the standards. This ensures that the standards will not only be accepted, but fully embraced by teachers. In order to succeed, teachers need leaders from within their own ranks. Pockets of leadership are already in place. And we believe that a, a, a critical mass of mathematical knowledge, mathematically knowledgeable teacher leaders can be built as the engine for the implementation So um, the role of teachers, I, I just wanted to um, make two, this is sort of nothing about uh, school math teaching, this is about university math teaching, uh, but uh, it makes a very similar point uh, to uh, teachers as, as engines. Um, so there's a person named David Pursued, he was President of uh, Mathematical Association, uh, American, uh, the MAA, Mathematical Association of America, and uh, is a math professor at McAllister. And he uh, is a PI on an ongoing mega study of the teaching of calculus <laughs> in the US. Uh, 800 schools, 
the design was epidemiological. I always stumble over that word. In other words, no preconceptions about teaching philosophy, no preconceptions about class size, curriculum design, anything. Just look at programs and try to measure uh, net gain uh, from coming in status to leaving status in first year calculus. I forget what the number is around here. We just changed the semester. And Ohio State's kind of, we know guys fly low to the trees. We're about 10 years behind us. So we just changed the semesters back to semesters this, this summer. I don't know what the number is anymore. <laughs> I don't know what use it is. OK. So characteristics of successful programs. So um, he gave an interim report on the results of the study. The find that it has a second phase where the place they identified, I don't know, 15, 20, um, that they want to study then in great depth over the next uh, three or four years. That's, it's quite a, quite a large study. So characteristics of, of, of success, big class, small class, traditional lecture, inquiry-based, technology enhanced. The only statistically significant correlation with success so far that they have determined is good teaching as perceived by the student. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is a, this is what I'm saying is yeah. Listen to teachers. I, okay. Anyway. Um, and what were the characteristics of that 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 he lists? By the way, you could. Uh, you could do uh, calculus, David Pursue, just Google it, and you'll get the, the slides of the whole presentation. Um, listening, care, uh, student, this is students talking, right? Could you but, say yeah. that again? What would we look up to find that slide show? Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, if I could get in my email, I could give you the URL. But if you just, um, uh, David Pursue, <coughs> that pursued. Um, and in fact, the easiest is just go McAllister, um, EDU. Um, his, his website, just McAllister, just Google McAllister <coughs> College and click on him. He's, he's got it posted on his, his website. I think that's the one place where it's taken to get. Yeah, so what did, what, so what, what did they call? Listen carefully to my question allows me time for, to understand difficult ideas, presented more than one method for solving the problem, ask questions to determine if I understood. I mean, we know all these things, right? We, we practice all these things well. I mean, I, yeah. I, I do guilt um, from my early days, and I can't read this without so feeling guilty. <laughs> but anyway, um, um, Discussed application, encourage students to seek help, frequently prepared extra material, assignments were challenging but doable, exams were a good assessment of what I learned. That was the that was the list. And um, I mean one thing that that um, I take away from the other part, um, big class, small class. That style of teaching is um, there is quality and diversity. Um, we are all very different, and our students are very different on how they conceptualize things, how they think. Um, their society, uh, their cultural formation is very different. Um, uh, learning by watching in some societies is almost. A, a ritualistic entrance into engagement, right? Um, in other societies, it's not. Um, so, um, I, and I think this is the same thing is true in our teachers. So, um, developing a professional culture that's going to be broadly successful must allow teachers or teachers to access and participate in very diverse ways from very different 
already performed. We are not going to do that by figuring out for uh, that, that profession how that happens. Shared goals, of course, but uh, different paths. Okay, so let me end by what I feel are some opportunities for the center and for this university to, uh, to take advantage of uh, what I hope will be uh, a sane engagement that <laughs> this country has with this opportunity. Um, am I taking bets with I bet a year salary? No. <laughs> but anyway, certainly hoping that not many, many of us are working try to lower expectations, lengthen the timeline, and uh, protect the interests of teachers. Um, so, um, yeah, of course, continue the formation uh, and all the programs, but expand the, the philosophy. And, um, well, in the standards themselves, one of the Hallmarks is coherence, mathematical coherence. Uh, the antithesis of, of the mile wide, inch deep uh, criticism of, of uh, school math education. And fewer, there are fewer topics than in the current. They, uh, the revisiting of the same topic at different grade levels doesn't, basically does not happen built on the need to proceed through a coherent journey and not, uh, not recycle or not um, also if there are if there is some commonality of what is done in third grade then uh, the fourth grade teacher that inherits half the class from somewhere wherever um, has the opportunity Okay, so, um, and I think um, that coherence uh, and articulation of where the program fits, both programmatically and institutionally, among the many constituencies, not only here in Utah, but around the country, and I, I guess I'm gonna make a, a, a plug for taking advantage of what other people have done and learned and, and uh, accessing those Sources, uh, I think we have opportunities to do that. So, uh, in next steps, much to learn from others. We're at the top, <laughs> okay, and much to contribute to others also. Um, I would say, and you say, oh, and that, this is what I alluded to before about, you know, do you. My goodness, uh, you know, we're already so stretched just trying to deal with things in Utah. How can we enter into this national dialogue and go to these people and all this other stuff? Um, I would make the case that, especially in the long term, that one cannot be as effective locally <laughs> without having access to the resources that more national connections. Um, so, um, yeah, this is just a repeat. Visible involvement in national programs for implementation of the common core as I would consider that an opportunity. And um, also, visible involvement in the national program for incorporation of the common core in the pre service. And uh, yeah, I'm beginning to repeat myself here. So, uh, I mean, in terms of, I mean, to me, a local case study in the advantage of, of the national connection uh, exists within, our, within the math department itself. I mean, the math department, starting in the mid 1970s, and before that, I came, made a conscious decision to 
invite out <laughs> very strong mathematicians from all over to talk to us, tell us what we should be doing, help us. Uh, um, and that uh, and, and slowly built up a national presence that, um, I mean, it's a big deal when you get a job at the University of Utah in mathematics uh, anymore among our, among our young people. And you know, the state's not that big, right? <laughs> Small state um, out here in the desert and all of that. That's, that's an awful lot uh, to, uh, this, this came from, I think, very good leadership It happened, and uh, yeah, anyway, I think it's great. Um, I will stop there. Uh, thank you all for your patience. And if you didn't ask any really hard questions, so I can get up like some of the math educators did when I gave this uh, presentation. <laughs> and say, what are you, you know, doing here? You're trying to co opt them. <laughs> you didn't do that. <laughs> anyway, so uh, thank you all very much. So um, I think that articulating, for example, the Math for America connection that has been so well made with the, if you will, the in-state infrastructure is, is what I think part city is another, uh, you know, so there's a search for math educators, for example. Um, to me, the opportunity is to do what the math department did, you know, 40 or 50 or 100 years ago, however long it was before I came here, <laughs> a long time ago, right? Okay, so who are the absolutely <coughs> best people out in the country? Well, let's get them to come visit. Let's get them to talk to us. Let's uh, develop relationships with them. Let's and let's learn what we have to do to configure an environment where we can uh, get and keep um, really strong people. And uh, I mean, that takes time. It takes patience. Uh, in fact, um, so I hope I'm not talking out of school. The 1975. I learned when I got here. Um, so for uh, personal uh, reasons, I was extremely poor in 1975 when I came here, and it was right in the middle of the math department doing all of this, and they had all these people coming in, and there was always a dinner every night for, you know. So I basically supported myself for the year. But, uh, they had so many uh, people come through, and it took a few years, but they developed connections and um, you know Utah is looking there's they devoted one full professor salary and benefits for the year to the budget like that budget to bring all those people and do that so that, that was why I could get a free dinner <laughs> anyway um, and so those those are the kind of things that, those are the kind of things that, that, that one of, I mean one of the people that I would put in that category is someone who came through here here early in her career Janine Remillard uh, is the kind of the kind of person that I think that's the kind of yes uh, I am a fifth installer from Korea uh -huh. this university. Uh, thank you for your good presentation. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, you say uh, new math uh, came in the 1960s, right? Uh, came and uh, new math uh, read yes. for 10 years uh, from uh, 1960s to 1970s. Right? I will uh, talk about it. 
right now, uh, a rare person in the world, uh, I'm interested in uh, best teacher, professional teacher. Yeah. Uh, I'm very interested in this. But uh, you say uh, maybe uh, it takes uh, one generation to uh -huh. make uh, teachers of the best, uh, best teachers. Teacher by teacher. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That is uh, one suggestion. But sometimes uh, uh, they have uh, ownership, but they should uh, get a partnership. They, uh, I, I'm just sorry. they should get a partnership. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just teachers cannot. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Of course. That is yeah. uh, another uh, problem.
at least somewhat. That that would be what I would say. I mean, um, yeah, YPV. Yeah, no, last evening we were talking, and he said in Taiwan, he said people fight to be an elementary teacher. It's like 10 percent of the applicants uh, are accepted as elementary teacher status is is is, is quite a bit higher and historically. I um, that, um, that has implications for salary, it has implications for working conditions, it has implications for articulating uh, the, the educational needs to the society at large, right? And, uh, uh, but there's a, a, a step within the profession, uh, the opportunity that's needed to, to take a step in that, it's not to be. Uh, of the leadership is thinking in, in, in this way, um, there is an opportunity. It, it's going to be very long, it's going to be very slow, it's going to start very small, and, but um, steady as you go. Small, <coughs> yeah. So I think we have time for one more question. Okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No. <laughs> yeah. your, your observation of it might take a generation to uh, implement or see uh, improvement in this new curriculum uh, seems to me a little pessimistic. Uh, why wouldn't it be the case that uh, a few years after the teachers are comfortable with the, with the new textbooks, we wouldn't see the improvement immediately? So um, it, it, this is not a zero to one thing, right? Uh, I mean, of course, there would be what presumes that there are communities, teachers, uh, school districts perfectly capable in the short term, right, of, 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 of running with all of this. But um, there are a, a lot of communities that aren't. Uh, the, the, the standards require both in terms of content, knowledge, mathematical practice, habits of thought, um, in teaching uh, that are not understood at, at an appropriate level in an awful lot of uh, areas, whatever, um, uh, it's a million, more than a million t-shirts, right? I mean, that's, a, I just, but what I could see is existence proofs in a few years, right? And that resonating, and uh, that, I mean, you know, it took it like 25 years for God's sake. <laughs> I mean, that, I don't know, could be totally wrong. I, I'm not a professional in these things, I'm just talking. Great. Thank you so much for that.